German are sitting in a tavern in Hamelin. I think that's in German. And the Ukrainian asks if the legend of the Pied Piper is true. The German says, well, not quite. And he pulled a small mouse out of his pocket. The mouse begins to whistle and marches around in circles. Rats and mice come out of all the nooks and crevices in the tavern, following the whistling mouse. The mouse marches all the rodents around the tavern twice and then out the door into the river Weezer, where they all drown. Ukrainian asks, have you got any small whistling Russians? <laughs> it's not a true story. First John chapter 5, 14 and 15 says this. This is the confidence we have in approaching God, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have what, what we asked of him. Would you bow your heads with me? Dear Lord, we thank you this morning for the opportunity to bring these morsels from your word and from your heart, Lord. And we ask that you direct these morsels into the hearts of your believer, your believer friends here, Lord, and that they will have the effect that you want them to have. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, there are verses that seem to indicate that whatever we ask in faith, we receive. Mark 11, 24, therefore I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer, Believe that you have received it, and it will be yours. We've all heard these verses before. If we isolate those verses and build a theology around them, like some do, it can be faith-shattering when things do not happen as we anticipate it. It is wiser to step back and consider the whole counsel of God not just build a theology around certain things. Anytime we build a, a doctrine around one or two verses, we're headed for trouble. Some ministries are based on the notion that our faith determines what God will do. But only God determines what God will do. Only God. We don't control God. God controls us. Let me get my plaque out. All right. <laughs> we don't control God. God controls us. Amen. Thank you. So God is not a genie in a bottle at our disposal. Some Pentecostal circles act like that talking about these hyper-faith ministries, these name it and claim it, blab it and grab it. We love the truth that God answers prayer. And he does. But sometimes his answer is no. Sometimes his answer is maybe later. Sometimes he just, just decides to do something else. But when God says no, we wonder why, and then what are we going to do? James 4, 3, when you ask, you do not receive, because you ask with wrong motives. And the King James says, asking amiss, that you may spend when you get on your pleasures. So it's my good pleasure to have my health restored, or to be secure financially, or to have things that come to my eye, and then I ask him this. I, if I ask God for these things for his glory, not for my pleasure, for his glory, or for the testimony to come, then I do not ask amiss. We do it for his glory. We ask so that we may glorify God in the blessing. Amen. I'm still going to make that sign in the front. I just push a button and it lights up. It's 
someday. So what remains then to ask in the right frame of mind. I have to come to God in humility. I have to recognize his authority and his sovereignty in everything, all parts of my life. God's heart is not melted by the power of our demands. His heart goes out to us because we are covered by the precious blood of his son Jesus. We don't have anything of our own to impress God with. He's not impressed when he sees me. Who are you? I'm just somebody that's carrying the gospel. He's not impressed. He loves us. We are blessed when he says yes. And we're blessed when he says no. That doesn't make sense to some. We're not happy when he says no, but we're blessed because God knows what's best for us. Amen. Amen. And I'm just training you a little bit here. <laughs> he knows what's best. God has his reasons. Some of them we will never understand. We don't have to understand. We just have to accept his will. We prayed for Connie Krause. We prayed in faith. We believed that God would heal her. But God, in effect, in the end, said no. I don't know why. We're instructed to pray. So we pray. We're instructed to believe, ask in faith. So we believe. We do what God tells us to do. Then God does what he's going to do. Not determined by our will, but by his. By his perfection. He's going to do what he's going to do. He's not obligated to do anything. He's God. David fasted and prayed for seven days that God would heal the infant that was the result of his, of his indiscretion with Bathsheba. And God said, no. The child died. We don't know why. We don't know why. David wanted to build a temple for the presence of God. And God said, no. David's plan wasn't God's plan. So you're not the one to build a temple. He had the design, he had the material. But no, God said, your son will build it because you are a man who has shed much blood. We had a friend at the home church. Lovely young woman, had three children. And um, at this time, she wasn't married. She played the guitar. She sang. She taught Sunday school to the kids, first and second graders. She got breast cancer. And she had a lumpectomy. And she was prayed for. And she refused further treatment because she was absolutely convinced that God healed her. She went to a faith healer in Ohio. He pronounced her healed. And she died. God said no. We don't know why. One of her daughters was in my Sunday school class. This, is, this happened a long time ago. Many people are healed of all kinds of diseases. God touches them and heals them. And many are not. I was healed of rheumatoid arthritis. I have not been healed of osteoarthritis. I have my fingers and here and there. God said no when Paul wanted a minister in a certain place. This is in Acts chapter 16. Paul and his companions traveled through the region of Phrygia and Galatia having been kept by the Holy Spirit from preaching the word, 
in the province of Asia. When they came to the border of Mysia, they tried to enter Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus would not allow them to. They were carrying the light of the gospel, carrying the word, but God said no. Paul had every reason to think that his desire to carry the gospel came from God, and therefore he should be able to go wherever the darkness of sin enslaves the people. So he and his companions in ministry traveled extensively. They were all over the place. They were called to carry this light. Why would this place be any different? We don't know why. Paul probably didn't know why. But God said no. Sometimes God says no. We don't need to know why. We just need to accept it. Because God knows best. Amen. Amen. <coughs> when I was a young photographer and newly saved, I had a job that I loved. It was in Hartford, Connecticut. I was working in a, in, a, in a chain of photo studios. We had 24 studios, mostly in Connecticut and Massachusetts. There was one in Pennsylvania and one or two in Rhode Island, I think. And I really enjoyed that job. I was a studio photographer. Didn't have to go anywhere. And I had, um, you know, I already had a degree in that field. And my, and my expertise, I could put it to use. Sometimes I would open the door and there'd be two or three crying babies waiting for me there. Sometimes a bride coming out of the dressing room. Sometimes a family, some seniors. I never knew, but I was able to switch from one thing to another to another and do it very efficiently. But that job was perfect for me. I worked my way up to the head photographer in the headquarters studio in Hartford, Connecticut in five years. And they sent me over to other studios to solve problems. It was the best job. I thought that was a wonderful job. The only problem was that it didn't pay enough for us to make a living. Carol was a legal photographer in those days. She worked for two different law firms. Anytime we moved from one town to another, she, had, she could get a job in a day or two. She, had, she was a very highly skilled secretary. Matter of fact, she was a law librarian in one of the law firms because the lawyers made a mess out of the library. So she took it over. I mean, she was a law librarian in there. But when you know we we started having kids, and so she stayed home, and that was we had only half of the income that we had before. So then we got saved, and I started to pray. But I was telling God exactly how I wanted him to bless us. Lord, I want you to get the company to pay me more money. I want to stay here in this job. And God said, no, that wasn't happening. So time went on. Things got harder. Harder. Sometimes, I, sometimes we had to save up for two weeks to go to McDonald's after church. It was hard. So, I, so in desperation, I prayed to the Lord. I said, I'll go anywhere you want me to go and do anything you want me to do. I'll get out of this career. I'll go be a garbage collector in Alaska. I don't care. Remember, I was being very specific beforehand. I want to stay here. I like it here. I want to do this kind of work. I want you to just give me some more money. Well, God said no. But I had to approach God in complete humility. I had to honor his sovereignty. So after that, changing my attitude and humbling myself before God, I began to sense that a change was coming. And I got this letter, and I still have it. This was it. This was in. There's a much 
I mean, there isn't too much left of the envelope. This was written on July 28, 1974. And this was written by the guy that had been my boss in the studio in, in Connecticut. He was the head photographer of all the photographers there. He was also a buddy, went fishing together and stuff like that. Dear Woody, I need you here. Right now, as Jim Highfield, a co-owner, co-owner, and I are out shooting schools, the studio photography is in the hands of two women. Neither one is equal to a luring photographer, and both together are not your equal. We need a studio photographer who can handle high school photography, well, etc. I'm not going to read the rest of this, but he said, I think you are, you are the only man I know I would recommend. He hadn't mentioned it to the bosses yet. He just wanted to feel me out and see what I thought about it. So God said no at first, but he said yes, but in a different way. We didn't even have enough money to get a plane ticket for me to fly out there for an interview with the boss. I talked to him on the phone, and he had to wire me a prepaid plane ticket just to get there. And when I traveled out there, I had a Bible with me. And I came off the plane, Jim and Pearl, his partner, and John Mansfield, my friend. They were there at the airport to meet me, and I had my Bible. And Jim said, when I saw you carrying that Bible, I knew you were the man for me. It was very open and sensitive to faith people. So we moved to Illinois, and life was good. We moved out there. When I came back from that interview to Carol, I said I was riding around in a car with a Christian realtor showing me the neighborhoods in Peoria. And she said, are you crazy? We can't buy a house. We never thought we could ever, we never thought we'd ever have a house. We'd be in, in, in apartments forever. How are we ever going to do that? But the boss out there, Jim, he said, I want you to have a house. I want my guys to put down roots. I don't want you in an apartment. I said, Jim, I had to borrow money from you to get a plane ticket out here. He said, I will advance you the down payment. <laughs> it was just amazing. And he did. And so we bought a house. We never thought we'd have a house. We had a house. Life was good. I was able to make a living. We had another baby. But anyway, it continues that I... In fact, I come to Pennsylvania after, after five years out there. But First Peter 5, 6, and 7 says, Humble yourselves, therefore, under, God, uh, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. That's what I had to do. And he said no to my first request, because I was trying to tell him how to do it. Humble yourself, and he'll lift you up. And verse 7, cast all your anxiety on him, because he cares for you. Paul had a no from God when he prayed to have the thorn in his flesh removed from him. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, this is verse 10, I delight in my weaknesses, in insults, and in hardships, and persecutions, and difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. In my weakness, then God's strength shows up. Paul was a man of powerful faith. He knew God. He was the one that, that had to submit because he was going to persecute Christian believers. He did. He was persecuting them. He believed God. He prayed in faith. But God said no. Life was full of challenges. Sometimes God says yes. Sometimes God says no. Isaiah 46, 9 and 10. 
Remember the former things, things of long ago. I am God, and there is no other. I am God, and there is none like me. I make known the end from the beginning, from ancient times, what is still to come. I say my purpose will stand, and I will do all that I please. God's going to do what he pleases. Not what we think he should do. Not how we think he should do it. Not how the hyper-faith people claim. You've got to claim this and claim that. And No, we have to come to God in humility. Amen. Thank you. That was a premature amen. Okay. <coughs> God often says no to things we yearn with our heart to see happen. People with immature faith sometimes use that as an excuse to give up on God. God didn't heal my baby. God didn't save my marriage. God didn't give me the job I wanted. Our view is that God is obligated to grant a request like a genie grants wishes. But he's not. So then we will be disappointed when God does not perform for us. He doesn't need to perform for us. We need to perform for him. Amen? Amen. We choose whether to allow a no from God to shatter our faith or build it up. A no from God can teach us to endure even when we don't understand, which is most of the time. James chapter 1. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds. We don't like facing trials. But James, the brother of Jesus, said, Consider it pure joy when you face trials, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. God says no when it's part of his greater plan. God says no when a yes would harm us. God says no to teach us that his grace is sufficient for us. He says no when we need to learn to come to him in humility. He says no when we need to acknowledge that God is sovereign in all things, including in the lives of us, his servants. When he says no, we need to accept his will. When he says no, we need to seek his answer. It'll be better than our desire. His answer when I was looking to get out of that poverty situation was way better than what I want him to do. So we always need to honor God as absolute sovereign in every part of our life. Pray about everything. Trust God. Even when he says no to the way you want him to do it. Something else is coming. We pray for people that, you know, that have, that have life-threatening disabilities. They're problems, serious health problems. And we know that God can heal anything. And sometimes he does. And sometimes he doesn't. But in the life of a believer, when he doesn't, that believer is going home. And he's not going to have cancer in heaven. I'm not going to take my chopped off thumb to heaven. I'm not going to have that. I'm not going to have arthritic fingers in heaven. Amen. You're not going to have any of your disabilities or difficulties. You're not going to be limping around. You're not going to have a sore back. None of it. So if God says no, when somebody is demanding that he heals, and he brings the person home. That's his way of healing. That's right. We have a hard time with that. That's why I'm trying to tell you about it. Psalm 13, 5 and 6. But I trust in your unfailing love. My heart rejoices in your salvation. I will sing the Lord's praise, for he has been good to me. Good no matter what. Life is hard, but God is always good. Yeah. 
his decisions are way better than what I'm clamoring for. I mean, I shouldn't clamor? No. We're supposed to pray. We're supposed to believe. We're supposed to trust God. But we need to accept what he, what he says. We need to accept his answer. We need to say, Lord, I put this in, in your hands. However, you, however you're going to do it, that's up to you. You are sovereign. You are God. And there is no way. Amen? Can you stand with me? This was a different kind of message today. So as we go our own ways, face the trials we face, you know, we're all kind of the same vintage except for these youngsters over here. And we're all kind of the kind of a similar vintage and those youngsters back there. Most of us are in a vintage where we have aches and pains every day. The only time nothing hurts on me is when I get in the recliner. <laughs> but God is good. He's good. He's awesome, awesome. Lord, I thank you for the opportunity, Lord, to, to bring these few morsels, and I just pray that uh, this word will help when we face difficulties, and the answer is no, or the answer is later, or the answer is maybe, and we will, and when the answer is yes, and we'll get a blessing, and we'll be careful to give you the honor and the glory, for that's why you do it, but we'll be careful to give testimony about how good our God is. We love you, Lord. And we ask you to be with each one during the whole week until we meet again. Keep us all safe. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. God is good, my friends. Amen.